Tom Brook had always been fascinated by the ocean. He read many books on marine biology and similar topics in his teenage years. Further education on the topic was limited, so the next best thing for Tom was to take up an interest in surfing. He frequently spent his weekends hitting waves with his friends, spending hours in the water surfing and snorkeling. On August 18, 2012, Tom went to the usual beach he and his friends would frequent to have fun. They met up in the morning and planned to swim, eat food, then return to surfing for the rest of the day. When they first entered the water, Tom noted that he didn't feel like his usual self. He felt flush and disoriented, so he lounged on the beach until he felt better. His friends agreed, so they swam around a bit before accompanying their friend to a nearby restaurant to make him feel better. Some friendly banter and pasta later, Tom felt himself again and wanted to start surfing as soon as possible. They got their surfboards ready and paddled a few hundred yards from the beach. Catching waves as a surfer often entails sitting on your board, waiting for the wave to build up to catch it, so that's what they did. Tom noticed his friends were already on a wave while waiting, so he cheered them on. He remained sitting on his board, admiring the agility of his friends and how good they were at surfing. The calm water sloshed around him, and he expected a wave to start forming. But his excitement turned to horror as he looked to the side to see a dorsal fin sticking out of the water, followed by the giant mouth of a bull shark that bit into his leg. He screamed and lost his balance, causing him to flip into the water and get thrown around by the shark. Bull sharks are notorious for being aggressive and persistent with their food, so this was just the tip of the iceberg for Tom. His friends heard the scream and quickly started paddling to his aid, but they were still far off. In excruciating pain, Tom was still under the water, eyes burning because of the salt. The shark was not letting go. He tried to flail around and gouge its eyes, but it was still not giving up. In fact, it seemed as though it only made the shark angrier. By that point, one of the friends arrived at the scene, thrust his hand under the surface and clutched Tom with everything he had. He started pulling while Tom pushed the shark off his leg, and they miraculously managed to get Tom on his friend's board. They both knelt on the board, panting, with Tom moaning in pain. His leg was searing with pain and bleeding profusely. His muscles were ripped and tendons were torn, but Tom insisted on getting to shore as soon as possible. He didn't tell his friend, but he started losing consciousness. They reached the beach in a few minutes to a crowd of onlookers curious about the screaming. His friend helped him stand on one leg while he screamed for someone to call an ambulance. Tom's other friend rushed over and told them that he had already called an ambulance a few minutes away. When he saw the commotion, he swam back to shore to preemptively call emergency services. Thankfully, the ambulance did arrive right on time. The paramedics rushed out and assessed the situation with one of them immediately attending to Tom's wounds to stop the bleeding and stabilize him. It only took him a few minutes, but in the end, they took Tom into the ambulance along with his friends. On the way there, the paramedic told the young men they were brave for doing what they did and that Tom would be fine despite his blood loss. The paramedic was friendly and even cracked a few jokes that eased the tension. When they arrived at the hospital, the paramedics said they would admit him into their care and that the boys could either come back later to check on him or sit in the waiting room. They chose the latter. Eventually, they were informed that Tom was okay and would be released the following day. They helped him get back home with his family and supported him through his recuperation period. He never lost his love for the ocean or surfing, and he understood that the shark was acting on instinct and did not blame it for what happened. In his later years, Tom ended up steering his education toward marine biology, making it his major in college. Wayne Nielsen Our final story is about Wayne Nielsen, a commercial fisherman who had the misfortune of falling in the jaws of a ferocious great white shark on June 6, 2002. His seasonal route dictated that the ship he was on would sail from Kangaroo Island to Neptune Islands and finally arrive at Sleaford. This was a routine journey that Wayne had undertaken many times, so it was nothing out of the ordinary. On the morning of June 5, 2002, 
Wayne was tasked with handling the maintenance on one part of the ship, which included checking the engine and rotors, but he would also dabble in deck side issues such as netting and the pulley systems. Fifteen years on the job made Wayne the man to ask whenever you needed something fixed, and this day was no different. Just as he had finished his routine engine inspection, he was called to the deck to help the crew figure out why the main pulley system was not pulling the nets from the sea. After a short walk, Wayne made his way to the main deck and found some crewmates clambered around the pulleys trying to make sense of the situation. They cleared the way for Wayne to examine the pulleys and he went straight to work. It took him about five minutes to fix them and he turned around and lifted his hands in a show of expertise. The crew loved Wayne and his personality, and they applauded him after the effortless task. The nets were hauled up, and the abundance of fish was stirred even more by two fur seals also stuck in the net, fighting over fish, oblivious to the traps they were in. The crew laughed and poked the seals with poles to get them back into the water. The day after the seal incident was relatively uneventful and Wayne went to sleep soundly that night in anticipation of the following day. On the morning of June 6th, Wayne went about his daily duties. Everything went smoothly until approximately 3 p.m., when he heard more commotion and went up to the main deck, only to find the crew bickering about the same pulleys he had fixed the previous day. Annoyed that a new crew hand might have tampered with something and put the pulleys out of commission, he marched forward and told them to give him some space. Upon closer inspection of the pulleys, they were under much more strain than before, which caused a mechanical failure that Wayne did not want to explain. As he fiddled with the pulleys, he managed to get them operational again, stood up to test them, and found they worked. Happy with his work, he started back for the lower decks, with the apprentice mechanics asking him what the problem was. As he began explaining the issue, he felt his foot snagged on something. It was a loose rope from one of the main pulleys. At that moment, he realized that one of the ropes was misconnected so that the pulleys had no counterweight, resulting in the loose rope tightening around his ankle under the strain of the fish. As the rope tightened and the entire net of fish came crashing into the sea, Wayne was knocked off balance and pulled across the safety railing into the water. His back seared in pain as he smashed against the water's surface and plummeted down after the net. As his vision stabilized, he realized what was causing all the strain on the net. A massive great white shark was pulling at the net from the water out of the fisherman's sight. The shark zipped around the fish and swam around Wayne, seemingly plotting its intentions. Wayne knew he had to act quickly as he was losing breath and the rope was still snug around his ankle. He pulled a small Swiss army knife from his pant pocket and started slicing at the rope, but it was far too thick for such a small blade to cut. He tried with all his might to slice the rope, and he also tried to loosen it with his hands, but to no avail. He started to panic at this point as he knew the shark was an immediate threat, but he could not see it anymore. In his adrenaline, Wayne was too focused on the rope to notice that the shark was gone and the fish had escaped the net, effectively allowing him to swim to the surface. He had no time to contemplate further actions as his breath steadily ran out. Wayne swam with all his might toward the surface. Even empty, the net proved to be a great hindrance to the mechanic, but he managed to breach the surface and take a refreshing breath, followed by a shout of affirmation to his crew. While some rushed to the lower decks to help Wayne, others stayed up to see if he would surface. As he did, they erupted into relieved cheers. This, however, did not last. One of the young men on the main deck pointed a few yards away from Wayne and told him to swim urgently. As he looked to the side, all he could see was the dorsal fin of the massive shark dip underwater before he felt excruciating pain around the leg the rope was wrapped around. He felt a sudden rush of cold, salty water enter his eyes and throat as he was pulled back under the surface and dragged a few meters away. The pain was horrible but short-lived as Wayne felt the pressure release and he could swim out again. As he breached the surface for a second time, he could see the dorsal fin of the shark darting through the water and away from him. 
but it turned after a moment and started toward him again. By this point, the crewmates had let down a line for him to hold on to so they could pull him up. All he had to do was reach the line a few yards away from it. He swam with all his might and desperately grabbed the line as his crewmates hoisted him up above the water. The shark lunged at Wayne and held onto the same leg again. Wayne's hand slid down the rope and burned as the shark pulled him back. He screamed in pain as he was being pulled from both sides, with his leg eventually snapping off. The shark disappeared in a red mist under Wayne with his prize, and Wayne was left hanging on the rope for dear life. The crew hoisted him up to the main deck and tended his leg, ensuring the bleeding was staunched. The resident doctor of the ship took care of him as they diverted their course to the nearest port so Wayne could get the care he needed. He made a full recovery as he did not lose too much blood, although the trauma of the incident did leave some psychological scars. Our third and final story is set in the great state of Florida in the United States. Aside from California, the Sunshine State Florida houses some of the most beautiful nature and wildlife, but it also comes with a risk. Animals in Florida tend to be quite aggressive when provoked, which Clyde Millet would find out when he found himself in front of the jaws of a hungry great white shark. For context, Clyde was selected as one of the winners of a complimentary scuba diving course off the coast of Jacksonville. He was a teenager and originally from Jacksonville, so he felt fairly relaxed in the water and jumped at the opportunity immediately. The course was supposed to be held two weeks from the announcement, so Clyde was a little nervous as the team was taking them further away from shore than he had ever been. When the day of the course came, Clyde was sitting in his room, contemplating whether he should go. Anxiety and nerves were getting to him, as his mood when he accepted the course had fizzled away, and his head was filled with what-ifs and possible outcomes. His mother, Teresa, urged him to attend the course anyway, since it was a good opportunity to experience something new. He pulled himself together and gathered his things and rushed to the beach as he was late. He got to the meeting point within 20 minutes and was greeted by a familiar sight. A group of six people was standing next to a huge boat, conversing with themselves, but their attention turned to Clyde as one of the instructors raised his arms in the air and exclaimed, There he is! with a smile. As Clyde neared the group, they moved toward him, and one of the instructors slapped him on the pack and asked him if he was late because he was nervous. He nodded, and the charismatic instructor told him that everything would be all right, and to make a point, Clyde would be the first to dive that day. This would prove to be a mistake. They made their way to the boat. All in all, there were six of them, two instructors and three people aside from Clyde. One was a middle-aged lady working as a nurse in the nearby hospital. One was college-aged and studying English. And one worked as an accountant in Jacksonville. All of them were eager to head out on the water and enjoy the experience, and they all talked to Clyde in a friendly manner to get him to relax. In the end, he got more comfortable on the boat and was looking forward to his first dive. It took them about 15 minutes to get to their diving point, after which they donned their scuba gear and were ready for the dive. It took Clyde little time to figure out how the suit was supposed to be put on, and the instructor helped him put on his tank and respirator. He talked him through the dive process and what he would do when he got in. Clyde nodded and let himself fall backward into the ocean, with the instructor following him closely. As soon as he was in the water, Clyde opened his eyes to see the deepest blue he had ever seen and the chasm of nothingness he could not have imagined. There was no visible bottom, save for some suggestion of a coral reef and flora further than Clyde could see. A hand touched him on the shoulder, and he flinched, but he was relieved to see his instructor's face smiling through his respirator. He pointed some ways into the distance, and the two swam there to observe some marine life. The other instructor was tending to the rest of the group individually. As they swam forward, visibility improved, and Clyde could finally see the mass of fish and life sprawling through the water. He described it as everything he imagined whenever he thought of the ocean, and said he never regretted seeing it. They swam for a few minutes, taking in the sights. 
with the instructor looking at Clyde frequently with an I told you so look in his eyes. As the minutes ticked by, Clyde felt more and more free in the water, so he swam deeper and deeper into the depths. The instructor followed him, given his newfound confidence. The marine life bustled the further they dove, but Clyde couldn't shake a feeling of ambiguous unease. He felt as if he was being watched, but couldn't explain it. He turned to the instructor and signaled that he would like them to surface, giving him an enthusiastic thumbs up. They started swimming upwards, but something in Clyde's gut told him to look down. From the murk, a massive shark was swimming through the kelp straight for them. Clyde kicked upwards, jabbing his instructor in the ribs, and then pointed down. His eyes widened, and he firmly grasped Clyde under his arm, and they kicked toward the surface firmly. Clyde did not dare look back until he felt the shark distorting the water around him. It caught up to them. The shark bit into Clyde's leg with everything it had. He accidentally let the respirator fall from his mouth as he tried to let out a scream, and the grimace he made loosened the mask covering his eyes. He was now blind, without air, and being pulled through the water as his legs seared with pain. It quickly subsided, however, since sharks often take hold of their prey and let go to get multiple bites in. The instructor had just caught up when the shark let go of Clyde and surged through the water. He pulled him by the arm and kicked toward the surface with everything he had, leaving a trail of blood in their wake. The boat was getting closer and closer. They managed to surface, and Clyde took a massive breath mixed with salt water. Coughing, he took the hands of the other instructor, who had just finished loading the rest of the group into the boat. He fell to the boat's deck and screamed in pain as the broken bones and severed tendons in his leg shifted, held together only by the skin on his leg. The nurse on the boat tried to patch him up with a first aid kit on the boat, but Clyde was still bleeding. Clyde's instructor barely managed to get back on the boat before the shark's massive maw crashed through the surface after him. As soon as he jumped into the boat, he ran to the engine, steered them toward the shore, and sped up. After that, he knelt beside Clyde and talked to him to ensure he was stable and conscious. He was moaning through the pain, but he would pull through. After an emergency room visit and a few weeks of recovery later, Clyde contacted his instructor again, saying that he didn't blame him for the incident, as it was a once-in-a-lifetime experience he would happily go through again if it meant seeing the ocean in such a scope. He recovered completely and found a passion for deep-sea diving albeit chainmail was a new mandatory equipment. Chase is a young man who had always dreamed of visiting Hawaii. He had heard stories of the stunning beaches, crystal clear waters, and exhilarating water sports. He couldn't tour the beautiful place since he was busy being an intelligent student. When the opportunity finally presented itself when he got a summer break from the university, he jumped at the chance. He arrived in Hawaii with his family, and they immediately explored the island. They spent the first few days lounging on the beach, trying different foods and soaking up the local culture. But Chase was eager to try his hand at some of Hawaii's more adventurous activities. So on the fourth day of their trip, he decided to rent a jet ski and explore the waters. Chase was a skilled jet skier, and he was having the time of his life as he raced across the waves. He admired the breathtaking scenery, when something suddenly brushed against his leg. At first, Chase thought it was just seaweed, but when he looked down, he saw a large shark swimming beside him. He panicked and tried to speed away, but the shark was too fast. The shark jumped out of the water in seconds and clamped down on Chase's leg. Chase screamed in agony as the shark dragged him through the water. He could feel his teeth tearing into his flesh knowing he was in grave danger. He struggled to stay afloat, desperately trying to free himself from the shark's grip. He tried to punch the shark in its face and kick it with his free leg, but it was useless. Chase had no match for the shark's strength, and he knew his leg might be torn apart at any second now. Blood could now be seen in the waters as he struggled to stay still while the shark shook and thrashed him around the water like a light object. He was desperately crying and screaming for help, 
and he knew his life could be taken away from him anytime soon if help didn't come his way. Just when he thought all hope was lost, a local fisherman named Akamu appeared out of nowhere. Akamu had been fishing when he saw the commotion and rushed over to see what was happening. Akamu jumped into the water without hesitation and began hitting the shark with his fishing rod. The shark was flinching due to Akamu's attacks as Akamu also punched the shark in its eyes, nose, and gills to deter it from Chase. The shark eventually released its grip on Chase's leg and started to bite Akamu's arm, but Akamu was too quick and groped into the shark's gills tightly, causing the animal to get hurt and swim away in an instant. Akamu helped Chase onto the jet ski and raced him back to shore. The attack had left Chase with multiple wounds on his leg, bleeding profusely. Akamu called for an ambulance and Chase was rushed to the hospital. Chase underwent emergency surgery and the doctor saved his leg, but he was left with scars that would remind him of the terrifying experience for the rest of his life. Despite his trauma, Chase was grateful to Akamu for saving his life. He wanted to thank him properly and learn more about the man who had risked his life to save a stranger. Chase eventually tracked Akamu down and invited him to dinner. Akamu agreed, and the two men spent the evening talking about their lives and experiences. Chase learned that Akamu had grown up in Hawaii and had spent his entire life fishing and exploring the island's waters. He was an expert fisherman and had even won several local fishing competitions. As they talked, Chase realized that he had never met someone so passionate about the ocean and the creatures that inhabited it. Akamu deeply respected nature and spent his life studying and exploring the ocean's wonders. Chase left Hawaii with a newfound appreciation for the beauty and power of the ocean. He also left with a deep respect for the locals who had grown up on the island and had a deep connection to the sea. The experience had been terrifying but also taught him a valuable lesson. He realized that life was unpredictable and that one never knew what the next moment would bring. But he also learned that good people in the world, like Akamu, were willing to risk their lives to help a stranger. Chase returned home with a renewed sense of gratitude and a determination to live life to the fullest. He would never forget the terrifying experience in Hawaii, but he would also never forget the kindness and bravery of the man who had saved his life. Gabriella works as a shark trainer in an animal conservation center and public aquarium in Spain. And yes, you heard it right. She's a shark trainer who trains sharks. Although sharks cannot be domesticated and tamed to keep as pets, they are proven to have the capability to be instructed just like dolphins. The animal conservation center and public aquarium she works in have attracted many people, especially children. Their public aquarium alone has various fish species and, of course, sharks. Gabriella trains two sand tiger sharks named Javier and Alonso. Like most sharks, these sharks are generally docile, but get very aggressive when threatened or disturbed. Javier and Alonso were separated from the public aquarium. They had their own enclosure, which visitors could easily visit and see them being fed or trained by Gabriella up close. These sharks have been popular for being smart and well-trained by Gabriella. Javier and Alonso were responsive, but Javier was more responsive to music, and Alonso was more responsive to shapes. Experts would also come to the place to witness how Javier and Alonso respond to Gabriella's commands, and they think these sharks can open a door for more trained sharks in the future. And maybe the stereotype about sharks being dangerous and deadly can be long gone by the time people realize that they can be trained to respond like dolphins and not attack humans. One day, Gabriella was informed that a live shark feeding show would feature Javier and Alonso the next day. Gabriella was delighted to know that both sharks would have a live feeding show that can showcase their ability to listen to commands and be as docile as they can. The following day, Gabriella went to work early to see how well the two sharks were doing. As the hours went by, the volume of visitors increased, and they were excited to witness Javier and Alonso. As the show started, Gabriella stood on a platform surrounded by water in the middle of the enclosure. 
She began to feed Javier and Alonso with small fish and squid, then did a few tricks and commands afterward. The people were amazed by the sharks and their ability to follow Gabriella's orders as they were being fed. When Gabriella ran out of food, the sharks surprisingly started acting weirdly. She tried to give them commands, but they were now not obeying, but rather trying to bump themselves into her platform. The people became confused about why Javier and Alonso were acting strange and out of command. Gabriella explained that maybe they just wanted more food and gave out another order, which surprisingly was obeyed by the sharks this time. Gabriella heaved a sigh of relief, as the people also did. As she was about to walk to the side of the platform to get another food bucket, she accidentally slipped and splashed into the water, falling right into Alonzo. The people were shocked as they gasped at what they saw, with Alonzo growing aggressive, knowing that he was threatened by how Gabriella fell into the water. Gabriella tried to swim back to the platform when Alonzo attacked her and bit her arm. Gabriella was simultaneously shocked and terrified as she did not expect Alonzo to act like that. She has trained them and swum with them sometimes, but this is the first time she saw the shark going aggressively at her. The people thought Gabriella had full control of the shark, not until they saw blood in the water and Javier was also going to attack her. Gabriella tried to punch and hit Alonzo's face, but it was useless. Alonzo kept biting her arm while Javier attacked and bit her leg. Gabriella was helpless as she would be torn apart by the two sharks in a brief moment, and the two sharks had no signs of stopping any time until she was ripped apart. She screamed in pain, feeling her limbs being stretched all at the same time. The staff and other trainers immediately rushed to the scene to neutralize the sharks with tranquilizers. After the sharks had been tamed, Gabriella was rescued and brought to the hospital where she was treated. She suffered an injury on her arm and leg and deep bite wounds there. The management of the Animal Conservation Center decided to place Javier and Alonso in a more secluded enclosure and determine whether they should euthanize the sharks or release them into the wild. Gabriella survived the attack despite her injuries, but she would find it hard to walk again till she was fully recovered. The conservation center was temporarily closed until it decided the fate of the two sharks that violently attacked their trainer and left her temporarily disabled. Our next story takes us to Boa Viagem, Brazil, where Natasha Volkov, a Russian tourist, visited Boa Viagem in the summer of 1998 as a vacation from her stressful job as a nurse in Vladivostok. She was 28 years old, and accompanying her on the trip was her boyfriend, Ilya, who worked as a welder. The two met when Ilya accompanied his friend to the hospital after he burned his hand on some welding equipment. They talked after his friend was taken care of and eventually started dating. The weather in Boa Viajem was terrible during their stay. For the first four days of their one-week vacation, they had a lot of rain that made going outside quite unpleasant so they just went to restaurants and stayed inside, relaxing. However, on the last three days of their stay, the weather cleared up and presented them with high temperatures and plenty of sun to go to the beach. Natasha was excited to go to the beach, and Ilya shared her enthusiasm. They made it to the beach, and Natasha noticed that a vendor was selling floating mattresses, so she bought one and decided she would float in the water for most of the day and enjoy her time off. Ilya helped his girlfriend blow the mattress up and decided to read a book in the shade and then walk around and have a beer. The water was cold when she entered it since it was still early, around 9 a.m. The couple wanted to maximize their beach time, so they arrived early. Lounging around on the mattress was pure bliss for Natasha, so much so she ended up dozing off and drifted away from shore for a considerable distance. She opened her eyes to a kaleidoscope of colors shifting in her vision due to the intense sunlight, and she realized she had drifted a few hundred yards away from the shore. After the initial wave of panic subsided, she realized that she was on a mattress after all, so she could paddle her way back to the shore with her arms. She even took this as another opportunity to relax, as the sun's heat felt quite nice on her back. This is the point where things went wrong for Natasha Volkov. 
Something to note about most shark species is that they are quite observant and tend to spot shapes when they are hunting. So the shape of something floating on the surface of the water can be something like a seal or an unknowing woman relaxing. As Natasha got within a hundred yards of shore, she noticed movement underneath her mattress, which caused her to worry. She paddled faster. After a few moments, she felt a strong force bump into her stomach, lifting her about a foot into the air. She yelped in surprise and tried to paddle even faster, but it was in vain. Her mattress was punctured. It started leaking air into the water quickly, and Natasha lost speed. As the surface of the mattress started falling below the surface of the water, Natasha looked up to see the populated beach and its tourists minding their own business. She started crying as she realized that no one knew what was happening and no one was coming to help anytime soon. Her face reached the water and her attacker's presence was made clear by a single thing, a dorsal fin. She saw the bull shark zip past her and a bit further away, so she started flailing and screaming as she swam to shore with everything she had. Some people took notice and pointed Natasha out to the lifeguard on the beach, who immediately ran in and started swimming in her direction. She was still some 70 yards away from shore, but her progress was impeded by a searing pain in her right side. The shark had circled and came back to bump into her again. The shark's rough skin caused Natasha to bleed into the water. Not much, but this is a shark we're talking about. The scent of blood in the water heightened the shark's sense of smell, making it more determined and hungry. Seconds later, Natasha felt the shark bite into her thigh, just above her knee, and pull her under the surface. The shark flailed and thrashed as it held Natasha in place, and she exhausted most of her precious breath screaming underwater, so each second was valuable. She tried pushing the shark away from her leg, but it was not letting go. In utter desperation, she started gouging its eyes, scratching them, but that only made her hands bleed. It wasn't until she moved her hands down and pulled the shark's gills that it finally let go of her leg. After one last convulsion, the beast surged past Natasha once more, skidding across her belly and making her bleed even more. By this time, the lifeguard had finally made his way to the victim and pulled her back to the surface. Natasha breathed life back into her lungs and screamed immediately afterward, but the lifeguard held her close and told her to calm down and to hold on to him. He turned and started swimming back to shore quickly, as he understood that time was of the essence and that the shark could have been back at any second. They returned to the shore within a few minutes, and Natasha began feeling dizzy due to blood loss. They laid her down, and the lifeguard assessed her wounds and decided she needed an ambulance. One was called by a bystander as soon as they saw Natasha's wounds, so the sirens could be heard in the distance. During this time, Ilya was walking back to their bags on the beach when he heard the commotion and noticed his girlfriend was attacked by something. He dropped his things and immediately ran to help her, pushing through the crowd and helping her stay steady while the ambulance arrived. It got there in a few minutes, and Natasha was swiftly taken to the nearest hospital, and her wounds were tended to. It took her a few hours to stabilize, after which Ilya apologized profusely for not being there to save her from the beast. Natasha remarked that she knew he couldn't swim and didn't want to go into the water. He sat with her for the entirety of her recovery and provided all the support he could, even though she got to walk normally again. He accompanied her to every therapy session and stuck with her to the end, eventually leading to their marriage a few years later. Demi had always been a loving and protective mother to her five-year-old son, Marcus. They were inseparable, and their bond was unbreakable. Florida's warm, sunny beaches were their favorite getaway, where they would spend countless hours building sandcastles splashing in the gentle waves and creating memories that would last a lifetime. On a seemingly ordinary day, Demi and Marcus arrived at their favorite beach, brimming with excitement. The sun shone brightly overhead, casting a golden glow on the pristine sand. Marcus couldn't contain his enthusiasm and immediately ran towards the water, his laughter echoing. 
Demi settled onto a beach towel, her eyes never straying far from her son. She watched as he frolicked in the shallow water, his tiny feet sinking into the wet sand. But unbeknownst to them, danger lurked beneath the surface, waiting patiently. Suddenly, as if emerging from a nightmare, a massive shark appeared out of nowhere. It launched itself toward Marcus, its jaws gaping wide, ready to claim its unsuspecting prey. Time seemed to stand still as Demi's maternal instincts kicked into overdrive. Without hesitation, Demi charged toward the shark, a primal roar escaping her lips. She threw herself between the predator and her son, absorbing the full force of the attack. The shark's razor-sharp teeth tore into her flesh, its strength overwhelming. Demi's blood mingled with the salt water as she fought valiantly to protect Marcus. A nearby lifeguard named Ethan witnessed the horrifying scene unfolding before him. Reacting swiftly, he blew his whistle, alerting his fellow lifeguards and beachgoers of the imminent danger. He dove into the water, racing towards Demi and Marcus, his heart pounding with adrenaline. Meanwhile, Another lifeguard named Olivia sprinted from her post towards the water's edge, armed with a rescue buoy. She knew time was of the essence. As Ethan reached Demi and Marcus, he grabbed the struggling mother, determined to free her from the shark's clutches. Ethan and Olivia worked perfectly synchronously, pulling Demi and Marcus to safety. As the trio emerged from the water, the beach erupted into chaos. Bystanders gasped in horror at seeing Demi's mangled body, her blood staining the sand. Paramedics arrived swiftly, whisking Demi away on a stretcher, fighting to stabilize her fragile condition. News of Demi's selfless act spread like wildfire throughout the community. The tight-knit beach town rallied around her, offering support, prayers, and well wishes for her recovery. Cards and flowers flooded her hospital room, constantly reminding her of the love and compassion that surrounded her. As weeks stretched into months, Demi engaged in a relentless battle to heal her physical and emotional wounds. With unwavering dedication, surgeons worked tirelessly to reconstruct her torn flesh, while therapists guided her through the arduous rehabilitation process. Marcus stood firmly by her side through every step, radiating strength and hope as a steadfast beacon. Finally, the day came when Demi was deemed well enough to return home. It was a moment of triumph, a testament to her indomitable spirit and the power of love. The community honored the lifeguards, Ethan and Olivia, for their heroic efforts that had saved Demi's life. Demi's story became an inspiration to all who heard it, a reminder of the lengths a mother would go to to protect her child. She dedicated her life to raising awareness about shark conservation, sharing her harrowing experience as a cautionary tale. Her resilience and unwavering love for Marcus touched hearts far and wide. The story is set in the great state of Florida in the United States. Aside from California, the Sunshine State, Florida, houses some of the most beautiful nature and wildlife but it also comes with a risk. Animals in Florida tend to be quite aggressive when provoked, which Clyde Millet would find out when he found himself in front of the jaws of a hungry great white shark. For context, Clyde was selected as one of the winners of a complimentary scuba diving course off the coast of Jacksonville. He was a teenager and originally from Jacksonville, so he felt fairly relaxed in the water and jumped at the opportunity immediately. The course was supposed to be held two weeks from the announcement, so Clyde was a little nervous as the team was taking them further away from shore than he had ever been. When the day of the course came, Clyde was sitting in his room, contemplating whether he should go. Anxiety and nerves were getting to him, as his mood when he accepted the course had fizzled away, and his head was filled with what-ifs and possible outcomes. His mother, Teresa, urged him to attend the course anyway since it was a good opportunity to experience something new. He pulled himself together and gathered his things and rushed to the beach as he was late. He got to the meeting point within 20 minutes and was greeted by a familiar sight. 
A group of six people was standing next to a huge boat, conversing with themselves, but their attention turned to Clyde as one of the instructors raised his arms in the air and exclaimed, There he is, with a smile. As Clyde neared the group, they moved toward him, and one of the instructors slapped him on the pack and asked him if he was late because he was nervous. He nodded, and the charismatic instructor told him that everything would be all right, and to make a point, Clyde would be the first to dive that day. This would prove to be a mistake. They made their way to the boat. All in all, there were six of them, two instructors and three people aside from Clyde. One was a middle-aged lady working as a nurse in the nearby hospital. One was college-aged and studying English, and one worked as an accountant in Jacksonville. All of them were eager to head out on the water and enjoy the experience, and they all talked to Clyde in a friendly manner to get him to relax. In the end, he got more comfortable on the boat and was looking forward to his first dive. It took them about 15 minutes to get to their diving point, after which they donned their scuba gear and were ready for the dive. It took Clyde little time to figure out how the suit was supposed to be put on, and the instructor helped him put on his tank and respirator. He talked him through the dive process and what he would do when he got in. Clyde nodded and let himself fall backward into the ocean, with the instructor following him closely. As soon as he was in the water, Clyde opened his eyes to see the deepest blue he had ever seen and the chasm of nothingness he could not have imagined. There was no visible bottom, save for some suggestion of a coral reef and flora further than Clyde could see. A hand touched him on the shoulder, and he flinched, but he was relieved to see his instructor's face smiling through his respirator. He pointed some ways into the distance, and the two swam there to observe some marine life. The other instructor was tending to the rest of the group individually. As they swam forward, visibility improved, and Clyde could finally see the mass of fish and life sprawling through the water. He described it as everything he imagined whenever he thought of the ocean, and said he never regretted seeing it. They swam for a few minutes, taking in the sights, with the instructor looking at Clyde frequently with an I told you so look in his eyes. As the minutes ticked by, Clyde felt more and more free in the water so he swam deeper and deeper into the depths. The instructor followed him, given his newfound confidence. The marine life bustled the further they dove, but Clyde couldn't shake a feeling of ambiguous unease. He felt as if he was being watched, but couldn't explain it. He turned to the instructor and signaled that he would like them to surface, giving him an enthusiastic thumbs up. They started swimming upwards, but something in Clyde's gut told him to look down. From the murk, a massive shark was swimming through the kelp straight for them. Clyde kicked upwards, jabbing his instructor in the ribs, and then pointed down. His eyes widened, and he firmly grasped Clyde under his arm, and they kicked toward the surface firmly. Clyde did not dare look back until he felt the shark distorting the water around him. It caught up to them. The shark bit into Clyde's leg with everything it had, he accidentally let the respirator fall from his mouth as he tried to let out a scream, and the grimace he made loosened the mask covering his eyes. He was now blind, without air, and being pulled through the water as his legs seared with pain. It quickly subsided, however, since sharks often take hold of their prey and let go to get multiple bites in. The instructor had just caught up when the shark let go of Clyde and surged through the water. He pulled him by the arm and kicked toward the surface with everything he had, leaving a trail of blood in their wake. The boat was getting closer and closer. They managed to surface, and Clyde took a massive breath mixed with salt water. Coughing, he took the hands of the other instructor, who had just finished loading the rest of the group into the boat. He fell to the boat's deck and screamed in pain. As the broken bones and severed tendons in his leg shifted, held together only by the skin on his leg. The nurse on the boat tried to patch him up with the first aid kit on the boat, but Clyde was still bleeding. Clyde's instructor barely managed to get back on the boat before the shark's massive maw crashed through the surface after him. As soon as he jumped into the boat, he ran to the engine, steered them toward the shore, and sped up. After that, he knelt beside Clyde and talked to him to ensure he was stable and conscious. He was moaning through the pain, 
but he would pull through. After an emergency room visit and a few weeks of recovery later, Clyde contacted his instructor again, saying that he didn't blame him for the incident, as it was a once-in-a-lifetime experience he would happily go through again if it meant seeing the ocean in such a scope. He recovered completely and found a passion for deep-sea diving, albeit chainmail was a new mandatory equipment. Mary had always been fascinated by sharks. From a young age, she immersed herself in books, documentaries, and online forums dedicated to these magnificent creatures. Over time, her admiration transformed into a deep passion for their conservation. Mary dedicated her life to raising awareness about protecting sharks and their habitats. She became a prominent advocate for these misunderstood predators. One sunny afternoon, Mary found herself in the crystal clear waters of a tropical paradise. She had traveled to a remote island known for its vibrant marine life, including a healthy population of sharks. With her knowledge and a desire to experience these creatures up close, Mary donned her wetsuit and slipped into the water. As Mary gracefully swam among the sharks, she marveled at their elegance. It was a magical experience for her, being so close to the animals she had spent years studying and defending. She swam gently, always mindful of the boundaries between her and the sharks. However, in a momentary lapse of judgment, Mary made a mistake. She touched one of the sharks, thinking it would be a brief and harmless interaction. To her horror, the shark reacted with sudden aggression. It instantly turned on her, its razor-sharp teeth sinking into her flesh. Pain shot through Mary's body as the shark thrashed and shook her violently. Blood clouded the water, creating a gruesome to blow. Mary fought to stay conscious, desperately hoping that help would arrive. Just as Mary lost hope, a figure emerged from the deep. It was Olive, another shark advocate and experienced diver. Olive had been observing the interaction from a distance and swiftly sprung into action when she realized Mary was in danger. Without hesitation, Olive swam towards the ferocious shark, brandishing a long pole with a small spear-like tip. She knew she had to act decisively to save her friend. With skill precision, Olive struck the shark's sensitive gills, causing it to release its grip on Mary. Bloodied and weakened, Mary clung to consciousness as Olive swiftly pulled her toward the surface. Olive's calm presence and quick thinking were a lifeline in those dark moments. With every ounce of strength she had left, Mary kicked her legs, propelling herself upward. Emerging from the water, Mary was greeted by a team of divers alerted by Olive's distress call. They rushed her onto a boat, applying first aid and doing their best to stem the bleeding. Despite the pain and shock, Mary felt a surge of gratitude for Olive's courage and selflessness. Mary was airlifted to a nearby hospital where a team of skilled surgeons worked tirelessly to repair her torn flesh. As she lay in the hospital bed, her body slowly healing, Mary reflected on the ordeal. She knew that her passion for shark conservation would not waver. In fact, her experience had only deepened her commitment to protecting these creatures and educating others about their crucial role in the ecosystem. Months later, Mary emerged stronger and more determined from her recovery than ever. She resumed her advocacy work with renewed vigor, sharing her story of survival and the importance of respecting sharks' boundaries. Together with Olive, they embarked on a mission to educate divers and swimmers about responsible interactions with marine life. Mary's brush with death transformed her into a beacon of resilience and inspiration. She became a voice for those who couldn't speak for themselves and continued to fight for the conservation of sharks, ensuring that her own harrowing encounter would never be forgotten. On a warm summer evening, an unforeseen tragedy unfolded aboard a luxurious cruise ship sailing through the Mediterranean Sea. Sarah Thompson, a young woman passionate about adventure, 
was in a terrifying situation after accidentally falling overboard into the dark, unforgiving waters. Sarah had always dreamed of exploring the world and had saved diligently for this once-in-a-lifetime cruise. It took her years to save enough money with her husband, Elliot, to embark on that trip, and it was everything they had hoped for and more. The voyage was meant to celebrate her graduation from university, a reward for years of hard work. As the sun began to set on that fateful evening, Sarah found herself leaning against the ship's railing, lost in thought as she gazed out at the vast expanse of the Mediterranean. She could hear people walking and talking around her, but she only focused on the limitless sea expanse before her. In that moment of distraction, Sarah leaned on the railing, looking down, but failed to notice the rail bending under her weight before creaking and snapping at the joining point. It was rusted beyond repair. Sarah went over the edge and somehow managed to grab onto the rail, still attached to the rest of the boat, but only for a moment before her grip faltered and she tumbled to the murky depths. A man ran up to the rail to help her, but he was too late. People screamed and panicked as they looked at her in the water, asking boat officials to rush to her aid. Elliot was on the deck just below Sarah, holding onto the rail, screaming after her. He tried to jump across the rail and help his wife, but one of the crewmates held him back, warning against the dangers of getting caught in the current. Chaos and disbelief rippled through the vessel as everyone grappled with the suddenness of the situation. Due to being under-equipped for the task, the crew could do nothing more than throw a life jacket in Sarah's direction and ready a boat to go after her, but she was already floating outside their possible reach. Elliot screamed after her, which only got more intense as he saw Sarah suddenly cry out and the water underneath her turned a dark shade of red. She screamed for a moment before she was pulled underneath the surface and the image of a large tail fin came into view. They realized what had happened. Elliot fell to the ground, shaking, unable to comprehend what had happened to his wife in such a short period. The ship's crew took him to the infirmary, while others called the Coast Guard to look for Sarah, who was nowhere to be seen. The ship was anchored prematurely, while the Coast Guard could establish what had happened and what they would do to control the situation. After their vessels arrived at the scene, the cruise ship was sent to the nearest port, and after two days of searching, they concluded that Sarah's body could not be found. This crushed Elliot who struggled to deal with the grief and loss for years. Mary had always been fascinated by sharks. From a young age, she immersed herself in books, documentaries, and online forums dedicated to these magnificent creatures. Over time, her admiration transformed into a deep passion for their conservation. Mary dedicated her life to raising awareness about protecting sharks and their habitats. She became a prominent advocate for these misunderstood predators. One sunny afternoon, Mary found herself in the crystal clear waters of a tropical paradise. She had traveled to a remote island known for its vibrant marine life, including a healthy population of sharks. With her knowledge and a desire to experience these creatures up close, Mary donned her wetsuit and slipped into the water. As Mary gracefully swam among the sharks, she marveled at their elegance. It was a magical experience for her, being so close to the animals she had spent years studying and defending. She swam gently, always mindful of the boundaries between her and the sharks. However, in a momentary lapse of judgment, Mary made a mistake. She touched one of the sharks, thinking it would be a brief and harmless interaction. To her horror, the shark reacted with sudden aggression. It instantly turned on her, its razor-sharp teeth sinking into her flesh. Pain shot through Mary's body as the shark thrashed and shook her violently. Blood clouded the water, creating a gruesome to blow. Mary fought to stay conscious, desperately hoping that help would arrive. Just as Mary lost hope, a figure emerged from the deep. It was Olive, another shark advocate and experienced diver. 
Olive had been observing the interaction from a distance and swiftly sprung into action when she realized Mary was in danger. Without hesitation, Olive swam towards the ferocious shark, brandishing a long pole with a small spear-like tip. She knew she had to act decisively to save her friend. With skill precision, Olive struck the shark's sensitive gills, causing it to release its grip on Mary. Bloodied and weakened, Mary clung to consciousness as Olive swiftly pulled her toward the surface. Olive's calm presence and quick thinking were a lifeline in those dark moments. With every ounce of strength she had left, Mary kicked her legs, propelling herself upward. Emerging from the water, Mary was greeted by a team of divers alerted by Olive's distress call. They rushed her onto a boat, applying first aid and doing their best to stem the bleeding. Despite the pain and shock, Mary felt a surge of gratitude for Olive's courage and selflessness. Mary was airlifted to a nearby hospital where a team of skilled surgeons worked tirelessly to repair her torn flesh. As she lay in the hospital bed, her body slowly healing, Mary reflected on the ordeal. She knew that her passion for shark conservation would not waver. In fact, her experience had only deepened her commitment to protecting these creatures and educating others about their crucial role in the ecosystem. Months later, Mary emerged stronger and more determined from her recovery than ever. She resumed her advocacy work with renewed vigor, sharing her story of survival and the importance of respecting sharks' boundaries. Together with Olive, they embarked on a mission to educate divers and swimmers about responsible interactions with marine life. Mary's brush with death transformed her into a beacon of resilience and inspiration. She became a voice for those who couldn't speak for themselves and continued to fight for the conservation of sharks, ensuring that her own harrowing encounter would never be forgotten. Hawaii is one of the world's best and most beautiful tourist attractions, owing to its lush landscapes and extremely appealing waters. Natives consider themselves lucky to live there, and one of those was Emma Marsh, a young woman who found herself face to face with sharp-toothed death. She worked as a dental technician in Hawaii, living on the promenade beside the beach, and frequently went kayaking as a hobby. Emma had always been drawn to the sea. Growing up on the coast, she developed a deep love for the ocean and its wonders. Max, her faithful canine companion, shared her enthusiasm for outdoor adventures. Together, they explored countless beaches and hidden coves, creating treasured memories. Max was a golden retriever and fiercely loyal to his owner. On June 23, 1996, Emma and Max went outside to the beach, where Emma had a kayak handy whenever she felt like paddling out. The kayak was a two-seater, so she strapped Max in for a ride, and he also enjoyed it. The weather was pleasant, and the waves were not harsh, allowing them to go out some distance in peace. She gave Max treats along the way to make him feel more comfortable and calm. Everything was right with the world until Emma felt something sway the kayak up and down aggressively. There was no wave, and she screamed as something bit straight through the body of the small, flimsy kayak and punctured the sides of her legs, drawing blood. The teeth of the monster beneath her were grinding back and forth as it tried to let go and go back beneath the surface. It freed itself from the kayak, and Emma's hands trembled as she fought to maintain her composure legs searing from the puncture wounds. Time seemed to slow down as the predator lunged toward the boat, jaws wide open. Emma's heart leaped into her throat, her adrenaline surging as she made a split-second decision. Max was barking the entire time, teetering on the edge of the kayak, while Emma groaned in pain and tried to steer them to safety. Without any warning, the shark attacked again. It bit into the side of the kayak where Max was, jolting him out of the straps and sending him flying into the water. Emma screamed for him, but he was already in the water, frantically dog-paddling toward her. She outstretched her arms and took him by his paws. Just as she managed to heave him out of the water, 
the shark broke the surface again, biting Max by the end of his hind leg, but it didn't have enough to land a clean bite. She pulled him in in time and paddled back to shore. The holes in the small kayak were leaking water inside, and time was of the essence, so she paddled with everything she had, all while Max was yelping in pain, shaking in his seat. She somehow managed to cross the 30 yards to the shore, never stopping, and they made it to the shore just in time, just as the water in the kayak was starting to weigh it down and make it sink. In a panic, she snatched Max out of the kayak and rushed him to her backyard, where she could look at his leg. It was cut badly, but there was no severe damage, and he would be okay. A trip to the vet later proved that to be true, and Emma's wounds were also only superficial, although they were close to cutting tendons and arteries. Miraculously, none of that happened. The pair was on the mend for a few weeks following the incident, as Emma could barely get Max outside, let alone into the water. He never did get over his fear of the ocean, and Emma never wanted to subject him to that trauma again. John Donovan stood at the edge of the pristine beach, his bare feet sinking into the warm sand. The sun was high, casting a golden hue over the sparkling turquoise waters. John was an adventurous soul, always seeking thrill and excitement in his travels around the world. He had arrived at this remote tropical destination, lured by the promise of untouched beauty and legendary waves. Little did John know that fate had a chilling encounter in store for him, one that would forever alter his perception of the ocean's depths. As he prepared his surfboard, memories of his childhood riding the waves flooded his mind. He had always felt an unexplainable connection to the sea, an affinity that drew him like a magnetic force. As a young man, he would use any excuse to swim and surf whenever possible. At that point, he had been on that beach for a few days, camping and enjoying his free time. He was a hobbyist surfer and taught guitar in a local youth center. With exhilaration, John paddled out into the azure expanse, his heart pounding with anticipation. The waves rose and fell in a mesmerizing rhythm, taking him back to his childhood. An experienced surfer, John reveled in the thrill of the chase, the adrenaline coursing through his veins. As he rode wave after wave, a subtle shift in the atmosphere sent a shiver down his spine. The air became charged with an inexplicable tension. He was lying face down on his board, paddling forward, unaware of the terror below him. A bull shark, it was later established, was eyeing John and intending to strike. Unseen by John, the monstrous creature closed in with ruthless precision. Its powerful body sliced through the water, propelled by an insatiable appetite. The shark lunged from below, its jaws clamping down on John's leg with a bone-crushing force. Agonizing pain seared through his body, eclipsing all rational thought. The world turned upside down as John fought desperately for his life. He thrashed and kicked, his mind consumed by a primal survival instinct. Blood clouded the water around him. He was forcibly pulled from his surfboard and under the surface. He opened his eyes and saw the beast clamping down on his leg. With every ounce of strength left within him, John clawed at the shark's eyes, hoping to blind the beast and buy himself a few precious seconds of respite. The struggle beneath the waves was a relentless battle of wills. John's vision blurred, his body weakening with each passing moment, but he refused to succumb fueled by an indomitable spirit and an unwavering determination to survive. As expected, his gouging the shark's eyes did nothing to stop it, making it only angrier. Desperately thinking, he thrust his arms as far out in front of himself as possible, grabbing the shark's gills and pulling with everything he had. It thrashed more, sending waves of electric pain in John's body but its jaws weren't as tight as before, allowing John to seize the opportunity. In a final act of defiance, John summoned his last reserves of strength. With a mighty surge, he freed himself from the shark's grip, leaving a trail of flesh and agony in its wake. He propelled himself upward, desperate for air, 
praying that the shark would not recover too quickly. Gasping for life-giving oxygen, John broke through the surface, his body battered and broken. His leg was mangled, torn apart by the relentless force of the shark's assault. Blood trailed behind him, a grim testament to his harrowing encounter. He grabbed his surfboard and hauled himself up, paddling wildly to get to the shore. Before long, he was in the shallows where he could stand up and hobble to solid ground, seeing the shark's dorsal fin in the distance. As he lay on the sandy shore, pain pulsating through every nerve, John knew he had narrowly escaped the clutches of death. The ocean, which he had trusted before and felt safe inside, had become something to dread. His leg was bleeding, but luckily some bystanders ran to the shore when they saw the shark attack him. In the days and weeks that followed, John embarked on a grueling physical and emotional recovery journey. Each step was hard but necessary because he was determined not to let a shark change the course of his life for the worst. Eventually, he fully recovered and retained motor functions in his leg. The last story for today's video tells of three young adults named Noah, Abby, and Lily. They went cage diving and encountered a furious bull shark. Noah, Abby, and Lily were three friends enjoying their summer vacation trip on an island. It was their fourth day, and they all wanted to try exciting things together to make the most of their journey there. Noah suggested they should all go cage diving with sharks, to which his two best friends instantly agreed. The next day, they all inquired at the resort that they were in to go cage diving. The resort staff assisted them and led them to a boat with a scuba diving expert named Danny and another mate named Troy to help them with their cage diving. They all boarded the boat and sailed to a designated section of the sea where they would swim alongside the sharks. Troy provided Noah, Abby, and Lily oxygen tanks and helped them gear up for cage diving. They all secured their scuba gear first and gave instructions. Noah was thrilled to do the activity, while Abby and Lily were nervous. Danny said the cage was too strong for a shark to break into, which immediately calmed them down. When everyone was ready, the three young adults entered the cage and were gradually lowered. The three of them were impressed by the beauty of the fish, coral reefs, and ocean depths as soon as they got in the water. Noah brought his GoPro camera to take footage of their cage diving. Everything was going so well, but the three of them suddenly became bored because the sharks were still not showing up. What comes next after a couple of minutes will forever terrify the three. As unexpected as they thought, a furious bull shark suddenly charged into their cage at a fast speed, causing the cage to shake in the process. Noah dropped his GoPro and was about to reach for it outside the cage when the bull shark charged again and attempted to bite his hand. Luckily, he managed to dodge the sudden attack, yet ended up having a generous cut that released blood into the water, attracting the shark even more. Abby and Lily were now freaking out as the angry shark kept charging and pounding its body to break the cage. When Danny and Troy realized the three were in danger, they immediately operated the boat. Abby and Lily sobbed as they lifted the cage to reveal Noah's hand had been severely injured. They swore to themselves never to go cage diving again. <laughs>